So good afternoon. I, I first of all want to uh, give thanks to the snow goddesses who did not <laughs> close down this talk, which we've all so much been looking forward to. Um, my name is Ann Bookman, and I'm, I have the great honor of being the director of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy, which, as I think most of you know, is at UMass Boston's McCormick School. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the fourth presentation in a lecture series on women's leadership that is a core part of our fellowship program for distinguished public service leaders. This is a new program of our center, relatively new, um, and I'll tell you a little more about it in a minute. Um, but first, I just want to recognize some special guests in the room. Um, first, I would like to recognize um, and welcome Betty Tamor. Um, I think many of you know that Betty is the founder of really the signature program of the center, the certificate program, the graduate certificate program in gender leadership and public policy. Betty started it in 1969. It is almost 50 years old. Uh, I think, you know, Betty, yeah, it's a really amazing. Uh, Betty looked around in the late 60s at different levels of government and said, what's wrong with this picture? And she said, there are no women and there are no women of color here and we're going to do something about this. And so we've been trying to do something about it for, for a long time. Um, and, I, and I also just want to add that it was really Betty who came to Sherry Penny, the first woman chancellor of UMass Boston, and brought the program um, to Ma UMass Boston. And then with Sherry's support and Elizabeth Sherman's leadership, Betty was really the guiding light behind the founding of the Center for Women in Politics. So Betty, you it's just a pleasure to have you here and you continue to be an inspiration to us always. So I also want to recognize uh, several members of our advisory board who have joined us. I'm not sure everyone is here yet, but Helen Chin Schlichte in the back. And um, Lori Tamor Berry here in front. And um, we're expecting Joyce Fairbout Bowling, who I, I hope will join us. And I also want to recognize a special uh, person at the center this spring, and that's Professor Lori Nasaya Jefferson. Um, we are very, very lucky to um, have Dr. Nasaya Jefferson as a visiting professor in the center this semester. She is a faculty member in our Gender Leadership and Public Policy program. The students are raving about her. Um, and we're just, she's contributing to the center and the McCormick School in so many ways, and we're just very, very happy to have you with us. So thank you for coming today. So I want to tell you just a little bit before we get started about our new fellowship program for distinguished public service leaders. I have to get up my glasses at this point. Um, so we launched this program for two reasons. One is to honor and preserve the legacy of experienced women leaders in Massachusetts who have had distinguished careers, either in the public sector or the nonprofit sector. And the second reason is to address the underrepresentation still of women in politics and public life by building a diverse intergenerational pipeline that connects experienced women leaders with a new generation of emerging women leaders. Through a rigorous nomination and selection process, we chose four amazing women for the inaugural cohort of this program and it gives me great pleasure to introduce them to you. And please stand when I say your name. Uh, Maria Elena Latona, who is Executive Director of Neighbor to Neighbor. The Honorable Patricia McGovern, who served as a state senator in the Massachusetts legislature from, I believe it's 1985 to 93. Am I getting the dates right? Um, and Pat also, in addition to being a, a distinguished legislature, really broke the glass ceiling in the legislature when she became the first woman chair of Ways and Means. And if you know anything about the legislature, you know that that is the most powerful committee. That's, that's the control of the money, right? <laughs> so we, we, we had Pat in there, and that was really path-breaking. And um, I also want to introduce um, and recognize Dolores Mitchell, uh, the former commissioner of the Group Insurance Commission. 
And finally, of course, Jackie Jenkins Scott, who you will hear from in a moment, who are all here to recognize and celebrate her work and to hear from her. So these women have each been appointed as fellows for two years. Um, during the time that they're at, at the center, um, they get engaged in the life of the center in three ways. First, they reflect on their own careers and public service and share those reflections through this public lecture series and other less formal ways. Second, they become mentors to the graduate students in our one-year certificate program in gender leadership and public policy. And I'm already getting wonderful reports back from students who have met with, with some of them. And finally, they're contributing to women's history in a special way. Um, in partnership with Healy Library and Archive and the faculty and graduate students in UMass Boston's history department, each fellow is contributing to the development of a new project we're starting called the Women's Public Leadership Archive. And don't think paper, think the web, okay? This is the, the a 21st century archive. They are each donating a portion or all of their papers to the library's archive. And they are currently being interviewed by an oral historian, Jenny Peterson, who is with us. Can Jenny, would you raise your, raise your hand? Um, and excerpts from these interviews, plus documents from their careers and photographs, will be included in this unique Women's Public History website. So we're very excited to be launching that soon. So I want to stress the Center's commitment to this fellowship program as a way of contributing to this construction of what I call the diverse intergenerational pipeline for women's leadership. And this pipeline is really more important now than ever, despite, or maybe because, the first woman to run for president in the United States in 2016 lost the election. We are seeing a new heightened level of interest among women in running for office. We saw it in November of 2017 and we are seeing it now as women in record numbers across the country are coming forward to run in the midterms in November 2018. So let us not despair when we hear the next charge of sexual harassment hit the news, and of course we will. Let's make two pledges. Let's pledge, first of all, to fight for women's physical and emotional safety and dignity in the workplace, in the home, wherever it occurs against violence. And second, let us pledge to either run for office ourselves or work on the campaign of a woman running for office. And let's fight for gender parity in government as we have for many years. Let's up the ante in this fight and bring diverse women's voices to the policy making table. I think this will really mark a, a special time in the life of the center and the life of our country. So without further delay, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Kiki Adozi, a professor and associate dean at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. And she's going to be introducing our speaker. Um, I would just say this is Professor Adozi's first year at McCormick. And she's already become a strong supported and trusted advisor of the center. Um, Kiki has a distinguished career in her own right and holds a PhD in politics from the New School for Social Research in New York, and specializes in African affairs, global development, international political economy, race and identity, among other things. And she is just the author of a recent book called Pan-African Rising, which is based on her research in Nigeria and South Africa. So I'm very pleased to introduce Kiki Adozi, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Anne. I don't want to um, lay a guilt trip on any of you, but today is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to be honest, Anne um, sort of withdrew the, um, the offer to um, welcome you and introduce our eminent speaker today. But I said, no, absolutely not. Um, this would be a wonderful celebration of my birthday to uh, do so. So thank you, Anne, for always considering me. Um, and I want to join you um, in welcoming all of you to um, today's uh, event. 
Um, I know that I speak um, um, on behalf of Dean Cash and the McCormack graduate faculty at UMass Boston in saying that we are so proud of our Center of Women and Politics and Public Policy Leadership um, led by um, really the eminent Dr. Anne Bookman. Her forthright leadership and her creative vision in engaging women like yourselves at all levels of politics and policy is commendable and I just wanted to thank you for your leadership. Today's uh, distinguished <laughs> public service leader, Dr. Jackie Jen Jenkins Scott, is many things. She has a very long resume and I want to read it all. <laughs> but I will um, share with you some, some of the important items in this introduction, but, but most importantly, among um, her accolades that excite me the most um, is that she um, has an honorary Doctor of Law degree from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. <laughs> so that was nice to, to learn. Dr. Um, Scott is a, a prominent scholar in her own right. Um, let me share with you uh, some of her many impressive credentials. Um, she received her BS from from Eastern Michigan um, University. Um, by the way, I just came from Michigan State University. That's where I was for 12 years. Um, she is um, um, an MSW from um, Boston University uh, School of Social Work, and she completed a, a postgraduate um, research fellowship at Radcliffe College. She has received numerous awards and citations, uh, including Boston Business Journal's Women of Influence um, Award in December 2014, the 2014 Medal of Honor from the National Center of Race Amity, the 2010 uh, Visiting Nurse Association of Boston Lifetime Achievement Award, and the 2010 Color Magazine um, Change Agent Award. She is the recipient of the Associated Industries of Massachusetts Legacy of Leadership and the Pinnacle Lifetime Achievement Award from the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Um, there's so much more, but let me move on to some other important um, leadership accolades um, that Dr. Jenkins uh, so eminently bears. Um, she served 12 years as the 13th president of Wheelock College. Under President Jenkins Scott's leadership, Wheelock strengthened its core undergraduate and graduate um, academic programs. Um, she enhanced the undergraduate experience, elevated community and civic engagement projects, and expanded the college's reach internationally and globally. She emphasized cross-disciplinary collaboration and community partnerships during her tenure as president. And I don't know if this is um, politique, but I'd like to remind Dr. Jenkins Scott, that there remains a chancellor opening at UMass Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Scott is also a community leader. Uh, from 1983 until 2004, uh, Dr. Scott uh, served as the president and chief executive officer of the Dimock Community Health Center in Roxbury, Massachusetts, one of Boston's largest community-based health and human service agencies serving the city's most vulnerable populations. Due to her leadership there, over two decades, the health center is now a national model for integrated comprehensive health and human services. Prior to that position, uh, Dr. Jenkins Scott held several positions with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the departments of public and mental health. So it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome um, Jackie Jenkins Scott to present today's keynote lecture. The lecture's title is Leading Boldly, Keys to Responsive Leadership in Troubling Times. I'm sure that you will agree with me that this title profiles Dr. Jenkins Scott's eminently and speaks for itself. Please welcome me. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I thought as she was making that 
wonderful introduction. Gee, oh, this is gray hair. I'm, she's, she's aging me here. <laughs> I'm not as old as I sound. <laughs> but thank you and happy birthday. Uh, it's um, wonderful for, for you to share this uh, birthday with us. Um, let me begin by uh, acknowledging, um, Anne has already introduced my fellow uh, women uh, public service leaders, but I want to uh, acknowledge them again, Pat, uh, Dolores, and Marie Elena. I have learned so much from you. We have learned so much from you, and it has been such a privilege uh, to be in this inaugural class with these three amazing leaders who are bold and phenomenal leaders in their own right. So please join me in thanking them again. And of course, um, none of us would be here without Betty. So I too want to acknowledge Betty and thank you for being here this afternoon. So in the spirit of offering appreciation, I also, before we get started, uh, would like to thank in advance Diane, Donella, and Marta for the discussion that we will have in just a few minutes. Uh, these three amazing women are not only incredible leaders, but they have been dear friends for, as they say, friends of long standing. Uh, they have um, not only celebrated with me through the good times, but they have been there and helped to push me through when I didn't know if I could make it. So it is just an honor for me that you're here and that I have an opportunity to publicly say um, how fortunate I am to have you as friends. So thank you, Diane, Danella, and Marta. So I'm getting all the thank yous out in advance, so you know. Uh, a special shout out to Anne, the Board of Advisors, and the entire team at the Center for Women in, Public, in Politics and Public Policy. Uh, I have um, very much enjoyed being a part of this program, and you have inspired and motivated me and, and my colleagues. Uh, I know there's some students in the, in the audience, and I know how hard you are, uh, how hard you work, and um, I know that many of you are taking a full load at the university while juggling family and work. So I know that attending something like this takes time, and so thank you uh, for being here. Um, this room is also filled with many friends of long standing, and I can't call you all out but know that I appreciate uh, you coming this afternoon and supporting me and being here to hear what I have to say. So I chose this theme, Leading Boldly in Troubling Times, in part because we currently are living through very troubling times. I know we can all look back on our own lives and in the history of this country and we can say every era has troubling times. But this time feels different. Somehow it feels different. It's not just about the fact that we have this crazy political environment with an amoral leader. Um, it's in part because it seems like every aspect of our society is troubled. Whether it's politics, the civic community, religious community, the business community, education, all feel to be divided, and we seem to not be able to make progress. And what this reminds us is that every single day, we are reminded how leadership really matters and how important leadership is. So I was just reading an article published uh, recently in the Stanford Social Innovation Magazine, and Kramer and Haina, uh, they wrote on leadership, and here's what they said. Leadership is better understood as an activity rather than a set of personal 
or institutional capabilities. Talented people often exercised leadership on some issue and avoided on others. No person or institution leads consistently across all issues all the time. Prominence, resources, or positions of authority do not define leadership. What then defines leadership, they asked. It is the activity of mobilizing people to tackle the toughest problems and do the adaptive work necessary to achieve progress. They went on to conclude that instead, leadership defines itself through action. Now on the one hand, I was excited and I loved thinking about leadership as action. And on the other hand, when I think about leaders and leadership, I can't separate how they act from who they are, what they value, and what they stand for. Now we all know that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of articles, papers, and books written on the subject of leadership. But this concept of leadership as action is intriguing and exciting to me because I'm an action-oriented person. But I'm reminded that it's not a new concept. Over 150 years ago, believe it or not, John Quincy Adams said this, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. He said that 150 years ago. So as I think about great leaders, not just famous leaders, but great leaders, I know you all can think about somebody that you consider a great leader. I can't separate their leadership from who they were as a person. I can't separate leadership as action from the leader as person, a human being with values, talents, and yes, flaws. I believe that who we are, what we believe in, what we value is the foundation and the source of how we lead and our ability to lead boldly. Since I believe deeply that who we are, what we believe in, what we value, fundamentally determines how we lead, I'd like to share a bit of my own story. My family, like many African American families, migrated from the South to the North in search of a better life. My brothers and I grew up with four principles it feels like they were drilled into our DNA. One, as African Americans, we have to work harder, be smarter, work faster, do more, make no mistakes, expect no breaks. We have to be better. Not just as good as, but better. And unfortunately, I still tell my kids that today. And I laugh when I think back to 2007. Remember when President Obama was running for office? He literally had to pay his parking tickets in Cambridge. Headlines in the Boston Globe. He had outstanding parking tickets. He had to be just that perfect. He couldn't even have parking tickets outstanding. Now look at 45. <laughs> Can you imagine any of the headlines that we're seeing today when Obama was president? We have to be better. Two, to whom much is given, much is expected. That's a biblical verse, Luke 12, 48. We believe deeply in our obligation to help others, to lend a hand, to make a way for those who will come after us. And for many African American families, that was about family. It was about bringing the next generation along. 
This mindset is what inspired me to pursue a master's degree in social work and dedicate my career to advancing public health and education in the lives of children. I was working up to live up to my mother's calling to pay it forward. That's what we call it today. Three, education is power. It is the way up and out, and my parents would often remind me that education is the one thing that no one can take from you. It is also the source of our ability to truly make systemic and lasting changes for the better in ourselves and in our society. And that's what drove me to become the first in my family to graduate from college, come to Boston for graduate school, aspiring to change the world for the better. Four, it was drilled in us that above all, we had to live a life of integrity. That integrity is fundamental to who we are. It is what will get us through the most difficult and challenging times and allows us peace of mind and a good night's rest. Today we call this grit, some call it faith, others call it courage. As I look back on my career, I see that these four core beliefs were the foundation of my leadership and my accomplishments. They actually made me the leader, the person that I am today. Now many view my leadership through my actions, actions defined as accomplishments. 21 years leading Demick Community Health Center, arriving there in 1983 with the center in bankruptcy, demoralized and on the verge of closing. An organization that what seemed to have unsurmountable challenges. With the devoted staff and amazing support, over the course of 20 years, the center emerged as a beacon of hope one of Boston's largest and most comprehensive community health centers, becoming a highly successfully sustained benchmark organization by all standards of measurements. I left Demick proud of our many accomplishments, but most importantly, I left honored to have served such an incredible organization and community. After leaving Demick, I became the first African-American and non-academic to become president of Wheelock College, a small private college with a public mission to improve the lives of children and families. I served for 12 years during incredibly interesting and challenging times in a rapidly changing higher education environment. One of the things I'm most proud of is that we changed the look and the feel of the college to represent the diversity of our city. 30% of the student body, 50% of the leadership team, and 27% of faculty and staff were diverse. Now some will say it is this commitment, these successes, these changes that were, were the cause of the disruption that took place during the end of my presidency. As you can imagine, after three decades of transforming institutions, I have the blessing of having many powerful leadership lessons, lessons learned from incredible successes, amazing support, and most importantly, lessons learned from challenges and failures. But as I reflect on this legacy, I believe that my actions during the most challenging times provided me the most impactful leadership lessons. So in the few minutes that I have left, I'd like to offer 10 keys to leading boldly during troubling times. Now I warn you, that some of these keys seem really simple and common sense. You're gonna say, Jackie, there's nothing too magical about this. But as we all know, there are very few things in life 
that are simple and easy. So let me share these 10 lessons. The first, lead by the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. At the heart of every important decision that I made, I asked myself the question, is this the way I want to be treated? When we were making big decisions at Dimmick or at Wheelock, I said, does this place look like the place I want to be treated? Would I bring my mother here? Would I bring my children here? Our community deserves as much as every other community. And when I was making decisions that were highly personal and impactful, that would impact the lives of someone, their livelihood, what I used as my measurement was, I want to treat this person the way I would be treated if I was being fired. And what I've learned is that when we live and lead by the golden rule, people respect you. They may not agree with you, they might not like you, but they respect you. Two, know your why. I learned four things early in my career. I need to lead in a mission-driven organization. I need to be in a position where I can make systemic change, big changes. I need to work on challenges that are transformational. And I learned early on my philosophy of leadership, and that is that I was a servant leader. And I think that Max Dupree summed up my leadership role very beautifully when he wrote, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between, the leader is a servant. And I truly believe that as leaders, we are servants. Three, lead by example. If I want people to work hard, I have to work hard. If I want people to be transparent, I have to be transparent. If I want people to be honest, I have to be honest. If I want people to be fair, I have to be fair. You get my point, and on and on. Four. Take advantage of opportunity. So I want to just tell you a quick Dimmick story. Many of you know that Dimmick sits in the heart of Roxbury, Catherine knows this, on 10 acres of beautiful land. When I got the job back in 1983, the receiver handed me a report. And it was a real estate developer's assessment. Now, Dimmick had nine incredibly historic, beautiful buildings. And that man said we should tear them all down and salt the land, salt them away. He said, Dimmick is one day, it's going to be, this is going to be prime property for condos. We are 10 minutes from downtown Boston. I was appalled. <laughs> My heart was broken. Because when I walked on that campus, my heart told me this is where I need to be. And so I proceeded to figure out how we save these buildings. Now, I knew nothing about historic preservation. I knew nothing about saving historic buildings that were falling down and falling apart, literally squirrels living in some of them. But I was guided to a guy named Stan Smith, who was president of something called Historic Boston, and I knew nothing about Historic Boston. And to make a long story short, Stan came out, and he got intrigued. And then after about a year and a half, we worked really hard. I learned a lot about preservation. And we were able to get the entire campus listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And that meant that those buildings will never get torn down. That's not the end of the story. 
so the, the most beautiful building, the biggest building, had a 100-year-old slate roof that was going to cost $500,000 to renovate. We had nowhere near $500,000. We actually had zero dollars. After a lot of work, we were led to a guy named Bill Taylor. I didn't know Bill Taylor. Bill Taylor was the publisher of the Boston Globe. Had no idea that he was interested in preservation. Well, he got interested. And after a whole bunch of stuff with lawyers and Pat would know, putting, setting up a different corporation, we got the money, the $500,000 to replace the roof. Now here's the thing about Bill Taylor. He didn't want anybody to know he did this for Demi. No publicity, no public acknowledgement. And I will tell you that that was my big first lesson in fundraising. And I truly believe that Demick would not be what it is today if it hadn't been for the ability to seize the opportunity. So seize the opportunity, number four. Five, surround yourself with the best people you can, invest in them, and trust that they will do a good job. Good leaders have the courage to do that. Matthew Fairholm said, leadership involves developing people and the organization in order to deal and cope with both complexity and change. And what I've learned is that by hiring people who are smarter than you, who are good, um, you're going to do good and the organization is going to do good. The key is to hire the right people in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and we all know what can happen uh, when we make that mistake. Uh, six, the leader is always evolving. I'm just finishing up Tom Friedman's latest book, Thank You for Being Late. And in it, he writes about what is happening in society today. And he says, this is the first time in human history that technology is outpacing our ability to adapt. And that's one of the scary things that's happening today. And a lesson I learned is that as leaders, we are always evolving and adapting. And that is our ability to be curious, our ability to understand the role of change and how we have to change and help the organization to change. And if we can't constantly involve in our leadership, uh, it's going to be hard for our organizations to evolve. And I once had a mentor, a crusty old Jewish guy, and he was wonderful. And we'd go out to lunch every few months and when I was down and depressed and I was ready to leave, he'd look at me and say, is it the same job, Jackie? <laughs> and I would say, no, it's not the same job. And what I learned was, is that about every two years, my job at Dimmick completely changed. And once I accepted that and learned to adapt and grow with that change, I became happier, more content, more successful. Seven, stay in the green. At Wheelock, we had a consultant who was working with our leadership team during some really challenging times. And I will admit, I was not at my best as a leader. And one day, she came in, and we were having a retreat, and she drew a red line at the bottom of the flipboard and then about 12 inches ahead of, above the red line, she drew a green line. And here's simply what she said. Your job as the leadership team is to stay in the green. Every time you drop down here in the red, 
you're holding the organization back. And that's a lesson that I will always remember. We have to stay in the green as leaders. We have to be optimistic and hopeful, realistic, but stay in the green. Number eight, don't be afraid to ask for help. My father-in-law drilled into this principle into his children, and of course my husband Jim drilled it into me and our children. And it simply, he simply says, seek the best advice you can and then do what? Follow it. <laughs> so many of us get good advice and then we don't follow it. Strong leaders have the ability to get good advice. And they aren't afraid to ask for help and to ask for advice. The key is balance. And I will tell you that one of my biggest leadership failures was waiting too late to take action when I got good advice. I let a dangerous situation that was sending me, the leadership team, and the entire organization down a spiral um, that was disastrous. And it was because I waited too late. After having some strong advice, I didn't have the courage to step forward and do what it would take. So seek the best advice you can, but then follow it when you get it. Number nine, keep your bags packed. <laughs> I will never forget this piece of advice. I got it about three decades ago. There was an African-American man named John Boone. Some of you might remember John Boone. John Boone was the first African-American to become the um, commissioner, I think it was called commissioner of corrections in Massachusetts. He came up here from Virginia. And he spoke to our social work class. And he basically said, I keep my bags packed. And the reason I keep my bags packed is that it allows me to do my job with integrity. He lasted about 18 months in Massachusetts and he was gone. But it is true. If we're spending so much time worrying about what other people think, how we're doing, we get compromised. And that's a lesson that I've learned and I always remember, he was a funny guy. And last, when the passion is gone, you should be gone. <laughs> the simple truth is that you can't lead effectively and boldly if you're not passionate about the mission and the organization. Passion brings understanding. Passion brings optimism. Passion brings vision, courage and an unwavering commitment to leading with integrity. Simply stated, when we lose that passion, we should be gone. Because not only are we hurting ourselves, we're hurting the organization. So that's my 10 keys to leading boldly in troubling times. I'm sure that we're gonna have a challenging discussion but before I turn the podium, the table over to Diane and Danella and Marta, uh, I want to just say two other things. One, leadership matters. You matter. What you represent matters, and how you lead really matters. We never know who we are touching. I was walking across Dimmick's campus actually it was Wheelock's campus, about three years ago. I was deep in thought. It was doing a really troubling time. And I heard this quiet voice say to me, President Jackie? The students used to call me President Jackie. And I turned around and there was this young African-American woman, young African-American student. I didn't know her, I hadn't seen her. 
She gave me a hug and she whispered in my ear, I'm praying for you. And she walked away. I was stunned. I stood there and literally a tear came down my eye. And what I learned from that is we never know who we're touching. We never know who's watching us. We never know how we're impacting. And that changed, that simple act changed my attitude about what was going on with me at that time in my career. And I went back into that office, put my shoulders back, and tackled some tough issues. The other thing I want to leave you with is this thought. We are the bridge. We're the bridge between the hopes, the dreams, and the aspirations of those that came before us. And we're the bridge between the hopes and dreams and aspirations that we have for those who will come after us. Right during that time at Wheelock, I got an award from the Harvard Club. And I really didn't want to get the award. I didn't want to go, but I showed up that evening. Walked into this room full of people, and there was a colleague, and she came up to me and she said, Jackie, I came here to see you get your award. And I said, you know what, I've gotten too many awards. There's so many other women who are more deserving. She stopped me in mid-sentence. And she said, don't you ever say that. And she pointed at the wall of all these portraits of old white men. <laughs> And she said, see those portraits? You think about the great grandmothers, the grandmothers, the aunts, the women who cleaned their houses, cooked their meals, took care of their kids. She said, you don't have a right to say you don't deserve this. Put your shoulders back hold your head up, and you go up and you accept that award, and you accept every award you're getting, because it's not about you. So that lesson stood with me, that bolt of wisdom. It's really, it's, it's still emotional to me even today, because the truth of the matter is, we all stand on the shoulders, the dreams and the aspirations of so many that came before us. And she made me think about my own grandmother who had no education, who drilled in us the value of education. And after that, I will tell you, I have never ever said I don't deserve an award because it really isn't about me. So we are the bridge, each of us in this room, we're the bridge for all those dreams, all those floors that got mopped, meals that got cooked, and all of our dreams for the young women, the young men that will come behind us. So that's what leadership is about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jackie. I think I'm having a, a little tear coming down myself listening to that story. It was beautiful. Um, so before I call the panelists up, I, I just wanted to recognize somebody who I didn't recognize before, who's a very, leads a very important part of the government and the Commonwealth, and that is the Commission on the Status of Women. And I want to recognize and welcome Jill Ashton, who is the executive director of that commission. I think it's very 
important for us to know that there are commissions like this all over our state, locally, um, and all in all states. At least there were back in 1963. And it's a fight to keep them going. And Jill is part of that fight here in the Commonwealth, and we thank you. Okay, so I want to call the three panelists up um, to come and sit at the table. And I think as Jackie explained a little bit, these three women have all been part of her life at different times, in hard times, in good times. Um, they've worked together, they've strategized together, and so on. So I want to give a bit of a formal introduction for each of them, but then I'm just going to turn it over to them. They're each gonna speak for about five minutes and respond to whatever point in Jackie's talk they feel compelled to respond to. And then I'm gonna ask Jackie to come back up and kind of have a conversation with them. And then after a little bit, we'll open it up to the audience because I'm sure that you all have questions for Jackie and comments and responses. So first, let me introduce Danella Clark. Uh, Danella joined the Boston Arts Academy Foundation in May of 2017. She's the executive director. She has more than 25 years of experience in nonprofit management with significant leadership roles with the Dima Community Health Center, the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, MGH Partners Healthcare, and Bottom Line. And most recently, she led her own firm called the Give Back Group. And I want to ask you about that afterwards. <laughs> uh, Danella was born on what she calls the beautiful island of Jamaica. She immigrated to Boston as a girl, attended Natick Public Schools, and graduated from Natick High at the age of 16. She then attended the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. And she holds a special certificate. She's a certified fundraising executive. I'm sure there are many of us in the room that are gonna rush up to J Danella after, after this. Danella is a recognized speaker on philanthropy, nonprofit, faith, women's issues, and diversity. In addition to her successful nonprofit career, Danella has served on many boards, including the Metropolitan Council for Econom Educational Opportunity, otherwise known as METCO, the NAACP, and in 2016, she was appointed by Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker to the State Commission on the Status of Women. And in her role with the Boston Arts Academy, she sits on the, on the board of the Fenway Alliance. So we look forward to hearing from you. Next to Danella is Diane Luby, who I haven't seen in many years and I'm thrilled to see again. Um, from 1999 to 2012, Diane was president and CEO for Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts. She then served as the president and CEO of Horizons for Homeless Children in Roxbury, Mass. Prior to these positions, she had a 25-year career in various senior health care positions in direct service delivery, community health centers, insurance, HMO organizations, and state government spanning both the for-profit and nonprofit sectors. She served as the Director of Public Health for the state of New Hampshire and has held senior management positions at major health care and managed care firms in a variety of states, including California, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee. She travels broadly. She was the founding executive director of Manic Community Health Center in Quincy. Uh, Diane has always been actively engaged in community organizations and is the immediate past president of an organization called Project STEP, which some of you may know about, is on the Community Advisory Board of WGBH and on the Tufton Borough Library Campaign Committee. Throughout her career, Diane has been a champion for women's health and for encouraging the vibrancy of communities through participation in the arts. So you can see there are some threads that weave through here. Um, finally, I want to introduce um, an old friend and colleague of mine, Marta Rosa. Very pleased to have you here. Uh, it's kind of a link that Jackie and I have, having both known Marta for many years. Marta Rosa is president of MTR Consulting Services, a firm established in 2004, which offers executive level services to a diverse group of institutions, primarily in the not-for-profit sector. 
she became one of the first three Latina elected officials in the state of Massachusetts by running for office in her hometown, in her home city of Chelsea. She was elected as a member of the Chelsea School Committee and served for six years there, and then was elected to the Chelsea City Council where she served for three years as council, counselor at large. We at CWPPP think that women running at the local level is really key and very interesting and exciting to hear about Marta's history and lessons. She has served on numerous lo local, state, and national community-based boards in leadership positions. Marta has her master's degree of education from Cambridge College, and most recently, Marta served as chief diversity officer and senior executive director for government and external affairs and community impact at Wheelock College. So I'm very pleased to welcome all three of you and really look forward to hearing your responses to Jackie's talk. Thank you all so much. Um, you know, for me, when Jackie talks about standing on shoulders, I certainly stand on her shoulders. I often say to people that I trained at the foot of the best, and the best is uh, Jackie Jenkins Scott. I, in listening to your talk, Jackie, it's right when you began to speak, I thought about Jackie is a leader of action, but what immediately came to mind is that she is somebody that leads by her values. I had the pleasure of working for her, with her, um, at Demick for six years. And I can tell you that as I watched her at Demick and then as I watched her at Wheelock, everything that she said here today is that she leads with what the C's that I call, she leads with courage, with compassion, commitment, um, communication, and then she really is all about collaboration. But what I thought about as I was listening to her talk about action is she is a leader that leads with core values. So when you talk about that a leader leads by who they are, that is what I've witnessed for the past 20 plus years of watching this incredible leader. There were times at Demick when, I'll never forget one time we were so close to wondering if we were gonna make payroll. And we made payroll because Jackie was able to quietly go into a room and call somebody, I don't know who, to mm -hmm. ensure that everyone else got paid and it didn't matter if she didn't get paid. Jackie is a type of leader that was all about people. I remember when I went to Demick, I often tell my young mentees or younger people this story. When I went to Demick, I was working at Mass General Hospital, and I remember I learned this Bathaya that, oh, this development stuff is too much. They put me through four interviews, for, <laughs> uh, four interviews for a job. Jackie was like, oh, create a program, which we later did, Men Making a Difference for Demick. But we went through four I went through four interviews, and I'll never forget, I was offered the job, and at the time I was making $40,000 at Mass General Hospital. This is in 1998. And I negotiated with Victoria Howard Robinson, God rest her soul, and I said, but this is what I make. I'm a young mom of two. Can you match my salary? And Victoria worked with Jackie and worked out that if you make your goals, that you will get a $10,000 grossed up bonus. And I tell you guys, I worked really hard. I learned from Jackie. I learned from Ron Lavelle. Um, I pr helped with producing, stepping out. And the event came, and I made my goal. And I had gone to my boss at the time. I don't even know if Jackie remembers this story. I went to her not once, not twice, but several times to say, I made my goal. Where is my bonus, you know? <laughs> and so I'll never forget. I think stepping out was in October. In fact, I have a copy of the check. I keep it in my portfolio. It was December the first week of December and I was in my office working hard and Jackie came down because we were in Cheney building she came down and she said you're still here what are you doing and she said you know you've been a little sad are you okay when she talks about treat people as you would like to be treated and finally I mean I was at the time four levels underneath her 
And she's finally, I just had the courage. I said, well, you know, I went to so-and-so, not once, not twice, but three times. I've made my goal. I've submitted my report. And I don't understand why I haven't gotten my bonus. And I tell you guys, this is when I said, wow. She immediately, it was like 7, 10 p.m. on a dark night in December. She went back to her <laughs> office, filled out the paperwork, called our head of HR, who was Andrea Kelton Harris, called our finance person it was a Thursday evening and by Friday morning I had my check and I later think my boss was scolded and somewhere along the, the way she was uh, dismissed not for that but for something else <laughs> but that showed me as a leader this woman cares about people even when Jackie left Demick and some of the changes that were made, they outsourced all the billing and outsourced all the security. What's going on now at Wheelock? It's not that she speaks about, well, oh, new leader innovation change. It was always about the people. Oh, the security people now don't have work, or the billing people, or this week, as Diane mentioned earlier, the 100 people at Wheelock that's now going to be displaced. This is a woman that leads with care, commitment, conviction. Um, and so that's when, I, when I'm listening to you, Jackie, that's what I take. That's what I've witnessed. That's what I've seen. And you're the leader that I have aspired to be. For these past many years, there's not a place that I go where I don't say that Jackie is my professional mentor, she's my shero, she's somebody that I can pick up the phone and say, what, sh what should we do? Jill, I got to tell you, you're, you're sitting in the back of the room. When the governor asked me to serve, <laughs> I said, I got to call Jackie <laughs> to make sure, is this okay, you know, I'm independent, what, what have you. But what I take from what, I take from what you um, shared is that you are a leader that puts people first, that definitely treats people as the way you want to be treated, and that has the courage and conviction that if even if it's somebody on your staff, if they're not doing the right thing by people, Jackie corrects it. <laughs> and to me, that's what, even when, you know, success is not final and failure is not fatal, that's what people are going to remember by. That's probably why you're one of these four amazing fellows, because people will, as Maya Angelou said, people will forget um, what you say, but they'll never forget how you treat them. And I've seen that over the course of knowing you. It's, it is about action. It is about how you treat people. And leaders lead with value. You look at what's going on at the highest office. You know, it's like a TV it's like a TV show. His TV show, you're fired, you're fired. Just the ultimate disrespect and disregard for how you treat people. That's the leader. That's the leader. So I um everything that you took, that's what I take is that you are a leader that lead with your own core values, with your own commitment, with how you treat people. Um and you're my Shiro. <laughs> As Jackie was speaking, I was thinking that um, we live in such an obvious time today where every single day we see examples of how not to be a leader. And you almost have to gear yourself up in the morning and say, do I have the fortitude this morning to actually watch the morning news? <laughs> um, and so I think the juxtaposition of hearing Jackie, and when I always am thinking of leaders and people who I most admire and I most watch, I always think that it's a person who has a vision about where they're going. And I mean, Jackie and I probably have walked 10,000 miles because that's, we take care of ourselves not just by um, sharing ideas, but we always do it walking in a variety of places. And as she was speaking today, I was thinking, 
you know, I've never really put this together that her leadership isn't just because she has a vision about the position she's in at the moment or the role that she's playing, but she has such an intrinsic vision of herself and who she wants to be and what she wants to accomplish that that gets her there in a way that you really go with <laughs> dignity and caring and thoughtfulness <coughs> about people. So this week, I always have some little notebook in my purse that I jot things down that I want to look up further, or I want to be thinking about, or just something that's interesting. So one of my jottings this week was a um, article in the New York Times where um, I didn't know this term, confirmation bias. And I don't know if any of you saw this article. And what they were doing is um, a group of researchers from Norfolk University um, in England had done a study to find out if there is bias about leadership. And the way that they looked at this and what they were doing is they asked a person to draw a leader. Mm. Hmm. And overwhelmingly, what do you think it was? Men, men white really? men. And so <laughs> they said <laughs> that what they were actually trying to test is it harder for women to get, and they only were doing it gender um, basis, what actually, um, why and is it still harder for women to be noticed in the workplace as a leader? And overwhelmingly, they looked at this and they said, it gender affects assumptions about people's abilities to recognize emerging leadership. They said the stereotypes of male characteristics, which are always attractive in men, but always unattractive in women, if you speak up for yourself, um, if you um, are bold, if you look assertive, and how that gets switched around. And what the article came up with was saying, when we process information through the lens of stereotypes, our interpretation may be consistent with stereotype, stereotypic expectations versus objective reality. And so I was thinking about this this week in terms of coming here and the work that you're doing at the center and my complete joy at seeing all of the women who are running for office this year and how we can be supportive of them and how we can buoy them up. And I was thinking that I've learned so much over the years from Jackie before the terms were even talked about of white privilege. Mm -hmm. But hearing Jackie's experience compared to my experience, when we had such the same kind of traje trajectories of what we were doing, and certainly me working in Chattanooga, Tennessee was the biggest mm -hmm. <laughs> eye-opener and crazy thing. I was the only woman vice president in an insurance company um, that they'd ever had, the first one. And every t single time I'd be in a meeting with clients or anything, they'd say, a woman and a Yankee. And I think, like, <laughs> I'm just going to wear a hat with two big A's on the top of it or something for this. But I, I think through the years that this kind of bias, gender bias, that they're talking about here, on top of Jackie being an African-American woman, that the leadership that she has been able to exhibit and the positions that she's been in and what she has done has to be looked at in a way that we're all saying has not been the easiest thing. And so when you look at the long, long list of honors and accolades and what she's accomplished, 
with the most important thing to her of keeping her integrity mm. throughout this, then I think that's what we talk about when we talk about leadership. Hi, everyone. And thank you for inviting me, Jackie. Um, Jackie's definitely my shero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was privileged, I always felt privileged to be able to work with you um, all those years at Wheelock. We did amazing work. We have nothing to say we're sorry for. <laughs> we did great work. Um, you said a lot of things that sort of mimic the way my life has gone. Your, your, your statement about that bridging the past to the present. I've always believed that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. I'm thinking Gwen Morgan, for example, um, in my case, um, who was a great mentor, the late Gwen Morgan. Um, and many others like that, women and men who lifted us up when, when, when we needed it. And it's our responsibility, leadership comes with great responsibility for us to do that for someone else. It's not just paying it forward, it's actually getting there and doing it because mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do as a leader. Um, your stories about family, I was listening to my mother <laughs> as you were talking, um, and you've met my mother and I was listening to my mother, you have to go to school. There's nothing more important than going to school. Um, and as the first person also to be the first one to, to complete college, and now in my family there are a slew of young people who have bachelor's and master's degrees, but when I was coming along, I was the first one to break that, that barrier. Um, and so that's an important connection that we have the importance of people. People are, are always important um, when you're a leader. Um, it is about the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be leading like 45 is leading and nobody's behind you mm. except maybe the, some of the folks, but um, <laughs> the importance that people play in our lives. And, and you as a leader always cared about the people. You know, there are, I was looking up words that are synonymous with leadership and see if you see yourself in these. Groundbreaker, did you guys hear that? Groundbreaker yeah. in, her, yeah. in yeah. her state? Yeah. Pioneer? Mm -hmm. Innovator? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Trailblazer? Mm -hmm. That preservation story? Mm -hmm. um, Torchbearer? Mm -hmm. Trendsetter? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Frontrunner? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Pathfinder? Always looking for that next big accomplishment, that next big thing, that vision, always moving people toward a vision, even if it's not tangible yet. I always loved that about working with Jackie at Wheelock. I would come in with an idea and Jackie would say, go for it. Mm -hmm. Let's try it, let's see if it works. Never afraid of failure. Never afraid if we didn't make it, oh well, we tried that, didn't work, what's next? Mm -hmm. And unless there's failure, there's no great successes and accomplishments because we learn through our mistakes. So I always appreciated that quality um, that you have as a leader. And shepherd is another uh, word that's synonymous. And that servant leadership, which is definitely, if you look up servant leadership in the dictionary, you're gonna find Jackie's picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> now the other word that was in our um, theme today was boldly. Um, and I love bold leaders. I love people who just do it. You know, like Nike, just do it. Um, without hesitation is a word that you find when you look up uh, boldly, without fear. Even if you have butterflies in your stomach mm -hmm. as a leader, um, but you do it without fear. Uh, boldly means moving forward. And Jackie, as a leader, was always moving us forward, I felt. Always going to international conferences and conferences all over the world and the country and bringing back all these ideas and we were like, okay, let's do that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it would get done um, because her vision was so clear and we could see where she wanted to go. Um, and if she wasn't that clear, we would help her clarify and that was okay mm -hmm. because a good leader invites ideas, mm -hmm. invites innovation, invites others to participate in what they're doing. Doesn't do everything themselves, doesn't come this way, but comes this way as well. Courageous, you heard in her speech, courageous. It takes courage to say, you know what, I did some things really well and I also fail at some things and I could have done those things better. If you can't learn from yourself and your own mistakes, 
then we have a problem. You have to be able to learn by the mistakes that you make. And a leader that takes risks is bold, right? Um, and we took many risks. We put together an international conference that had never been done by such a little tiny college, and we had 43 countries on that campus in a week. That was an amazing accomplishment. We put that school on the map. Uh, a good leader and a bold leader gets things done. You said that in your, in, your, um, in your talk. But I loved what you said, my favorite line um, of your whole talk was that it's not about you. Mm -hmm. And when we understand that what we're doing, my running for public office way back when I was young and thin, <laughs> <laughs> when we understand that it's not about us, it's about the next generation, it's about um, seating, uh, movement. It's about um, building up others. It's about so many other things, but it's not about us. When we understand that, then we're really impactful. So I really appreciated that line. Um, leadership matters. Mm -hmm. And can leaders be made? There's that whole research, body of research. Are leaders made? Are they, uh, do they just come? Are born leaders? Um, I don't know. I just know that when a good leader does things in the right way, we see great outcomes, right? And it's not great outcomes for that individual necessarily, mm -hmm. but great outcomes for everyone around them. And you never know the impact that you're gonna have on any one person. I was giving a talk in Springfield many years ago um, after I had left public office. Uh, I decided that I didn't wanna run for public office anymore because I wasn't having fun, Jackie. You said you gotta know when your passion is done. And I've always left leadership positions when I'm not having fun. I don't mind working 120 hours, uh, whatever it takes, but I have to have fun with my work. I enjoy what I do, I love what I do. And I wasn't having fun in political office anymore at that level, and so I left political office um, and didn't run again. People still ask me today, why didn't you run again? Because I wasn't having fun. I was done. I really felt I was done, and it was time to make room for others. A lot of congressional people should hear that. It's time to make room for others. Uh, but I was giving a talk uh, on early childhood um, in Springfield, and a woman came all the way from some other part of the state to hear my talk. But she didn't come to hear my talk. She came to thank me. This is like, I don't know, 10, 15 years after I have left political office. So happens that when I was in the school committee my first year, she was having trouble with the school system. And I helped her with her special needs child. And that child today is a lawyer. Oh. And she came and she says, and I owe it all to you. And I had no idea, you know? Or when I supported the elderly in the building where an elderly woman got raped. And we supported and put together a program where a police officer lived in the building so that they could protect that building. The elderly woman, the people in the building saw me 10 years later and they thanked me for that action. You, you do these things because they're the right things to do. You, don't, you think about the people and how to connect, make the right connections. Another thing I loved about working with you, Jackie, it's making those connections. I'm a connector, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a relationship builder. And so brokering relationships was something we did extremely well together. Um, and so you thanked us publicly for our longstanding friendship. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I learned so much in 12 years um, about connections, about building networks, about um, not taking everything so seriously. Let's have some <laughs> fun sometime. Um, and so uh, a bold leader, is a leader who does care. A bold leader is a leader who makes things happen, not for themselves and for their glory, but for others and those around them and for the next generation. Um, so thank you for having this conversation, yeah. uh, Anne, and thank you to my colleagues. This has been um, interesting uh, for us to hear. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'd like to just call Jackie back up, and I don't know if you have particular things you want to say or questions. Or I simply want to say thank you. Um, 
you see why I asked these three phenomenal women to speak. They are all amazing, and each of you um, said some pretty powerful, made some pretty powerful comments. So thank you, and I'm going to just open it up to the audience. Yes. <laughs> uh, so this is just wonderful and inspiring for me. I just have to get the political pieces because you mentored so many political folks today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Papaya Carter. Um, I want to piggyback on that, and especially your comment when you said, "Don't be afraid to ask for help, but don't also wait too late to ask." And I wonder. Sometimes, if particularly being a black woman, we think that we have to be so perfect to move forward, mm -hmm. you get the advice, but so many eyes are on you, so many things going on, that you have to be almost like super perfect mm -hmm. to act because everyone's watching. Yeah. And um, and what I am going to say, I, you know, your last years at We Lucky were all great, and it wasn't a mistake. I think, and I'm, you know, you me so many things to people privately, but I'm going to say it out loud. It allowed me to watch and learn, and it saved my organization, mm -hmm. because we had a lot of the same things happening in a weird way, and your actions, and you, I, would, I would say that not only am I standing on the shoulder, not only were you that bridge, but you also rescued our organization, that now we can move forward to actually become a national organization, so thank you mm -hmm. very much for that. And you also pushed me to act quicker mm. and watching that and watch and also not always feel like I have to be perfect. You know, I spent a lot of time on the phone with Danella and others and, and we talk about this dilemma that happens for women, particularly as a black woman, you almost feel like you have to be perfect to act. Where I watch men, particularly white men, they just mm -hmm. there. So if you could just talk a little bit more Sure. Also, I'm going to say thank you. That was not a failure. Mm. That was a lesson, and that was a lesson um, for many of us. That was a lesson that saved my organization. Um, that's a lesson that we owe you. Mm. And again, I think Martin's right. You have nothing to apologize for. You helped usher in new leadership in many other places by us being able to watch you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That's. Wonderful. You know, I think um, when I started off talking about, you know, I think African Americans and women, and, and, and I can only speak as an African American, but I'm sure if we had this conversation in this room, the way I was raised, I'm sure Helen and others and others will say, yeah, I can relate to that. So I think we have the remnants of this business of we have to be better, we have to be good, we have to work harder, you know, all the things I said earlier. And, you know, I think we have this dream and hope that 
I always thought, well, when I have kids, I'm not going to tell them that. You know, they can be mediocre like anybody else. And no, we, we can't tell them that. So we haven't gotten there yet, but l let's hope um, that what we see happening in our society, I mean, our kids are different, um, but it is a dilemma. It, it's a dilemma and you, it, it creates um, a burden. I think Michelle Obama freed us up a little bit as a society. Um, but it, it is a burden that I think women carry, and, and I, you know, speaking as an African American woman, I think we carry a lot of baggage from generations and generations that it's probably going to take even more generations for us to, to overcome. Um, and I don't know whether we say that's, it, that's, it is, it just is. I, I was trying to say, is it good or bad? I, I don't know. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's, it is what we have to, have to deal with. So, Bethia, I would offer two things. I think, one, as a black woman, sometimes it's also about caring. And again, I look to Jackie's leadership, and Jackie is all about people. And I know, because I know her intimately, that in some cases it was because she cared about people, in some cases not even people of color, giving people an opportunity and then those same people um, stabbed her in the back, for lack of a better term, and then she probably, because you care about people, become paralyzed because you're somewhat disappointed that someone would do this after this is a very person you help. So one, for a black woman, I think it's caring. The other thing that I think you're right in is that sometimes, even as a leader, you want to make the decision, even when you have the advice, but whether or not, because we all report to somebody, in Bible Hebrews 11 <laughs> talks about authority, whether or not it's your board who may say whether or not it's optically, I know I'm, I'm getting ready to do something now and I have to check in with, with our lawyer where it's like, well, you know, we got to make sure you, if, if you're going to do this, you, you know, how is this going to spin to the broader whatever your community um, is? So sometimes even when you want to make the decision, you have to think about other things, particularly too in nonprofit organization or lean organization. Sometimes you start to think about, unlike a for profit where many um, men play, you really can't um, say, well, okay, I'm going to make this decision because you have to think about how is this work going to get done if you're in a, in a lean organization. <laughs> What's the communication plan and the messaging? But sometimes, even when you get the good advice, this is where the courage comes in to say, I'm going to go ahead and do it and come what may be prepared to stand by that decision. But sometimes, even when you get the good advice, you may have, particularly in a nonprofit, a board chair or somebody who's like, oh, well, I like Sally. <laughs> and you know you gotta go back and you have to so th that's just my two things mm -hmm. as a black woman sometimes caring and then sometimes even though you have the good advice you may have another key stakeholder who could be sure. because that person has done some manipulative things to keep it real that you're like okay I gotta watch on this yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dolores would like to yeah. comment. Uh, I'd like to put those two things together because yeah. I think the, you're absolutely right that sometimes you know you got to act on something when you get good advice, and sometimes you got to say, wait a minute, what's so and so going to mm -hmm. say or say or do? Yeah. Uh, I would commend to you Nancy Kane's book called Forged in Crisis, and the, the section that she had, it's about leadership, mm -hmm. and the section that this made me you know, respond to is when she talked about Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln uh, and the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. And Douglass was on Lincoln's case about doing it, and Lincoln resisted or delayed until the right political mm -hmm. moment came mm -hmm. in which it could be successful. Mm -hmm. in which yeah. he could reinvigorate the population
legislation to understand that this was not about the union, it was about slavery. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you take the advice sure. that you should sit sure. on it. Other times you sit, as, as you pointed out, and sometimes do it now because it, otherwise it, the moment will slip away. Mm -hmm. But it's not just balance, it's also timing. Right? And absolutely. You, you I totally agree leaders, with you. Sometimes have to take a lot of guff yeah. uh, from their own supporters and mm -hmm. the people that they like and agree with don't understand why they're they did it. But sure. I mean, that's, that's, a, sure. that's part of leadership is the one thing I think you, you didn't mention, namely that sometimes you just have to swallow mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. the opposition. Absolutely. It's really painful when it comes from your friends. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a mission and a goal that's, you know, up there uh, and it expresses where mm -hmm. you're trying to go and what your goals are, that's maybe some of the price you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Yeah. Dolores. Complexity. <laughs> yes. Hi, yeah, Heidi. How are you? Thank you for coming. That's a great question. Um, you know, I once we once had a a guy that we were courting to chair our event, stepping out, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, "I have to feel the passion." So he wouldn't take on the chairmanship until he came out to Demick, walked the campus, met people. So as a leader, I always felt it was impossible for me to be that external voice and not have a pulse or hand, an understanding of how the place, what made it tick, what was at the core of who it was. Because I think you have to have that, you have to know that, you have to feel that in order to balance both those external pressures and the internal pressures. And so it's hard. I, I can't say that um, I always did it well because um, that gets to one of the points I made about who you surround yourself with because no one leader can do it all. So you have to build a team and I think that's one of the most important things that the leader does is to build the team that allows you to have your pulse, your hand on the pulse of what's going on in, inside the organization and also to know what's happening externally that's going to impact you. And then you can, together with that team, take those calculated risks of when you need to do certain things to advance the organization. But um, you know, when I think about Demick, and it truly was true that I probably had about five different jobs during that, the course of that 10, 21 years that I was there, we are constantly changing. And if we get too stuck and not have the ability to understand what's happening internally with our people, as well as how we position that externally in the world, it's going to be hard to be successful in the long run. So it's probably not the best answer to your question. Um, Diane or Danella or Marta? The only thing I ahead? would add, Jack, is that you know there were times at, at Wheelock where I felt like we, I worked for two different organizations. There was the external work I was doing with talking to government officials and funders and all of those external partners. 
um, where I felt like, wow, this organization is fabulous, and everybody was in love with the organization and loved our leader. And then there were times I was working internally, and we were dealing with issues of race and issues of mm -hmm. equity and issues of faculty tenureship and all of those things. And those weren't easy to deal with. Those yeah. were all very challenging, very frustrating issues. And so you had fun over here, and then over here wasn't so much fun. <laughs> but both were equally important. And so it's that, always that balancing act. And as the external person, I always came back and said to Jackie, this is what I'm hearing over there, this is what I'm hearing over here. Because it's important for the leader to know what, what's happening in the organization. Mm -hmm. So it's having you know, more than two eyes <laughs> and two ears. But, but I, I wanted to say to your comment that perfection, I picked up on the word perfection. I have never felt I had to be perfect. I always felt, even when I was very young and entered the, the first school committee meeting I ever went to, I had to be doubly prepared, 10 times more prepared than anybody else. I had to have my facts right, I had to have my research done, I had to read everything carefully. None of those other folks on the school committee read a thing, let me tell you. <laughs> but I, <laughs> so it wasn't about trying to be perfect because we can't accomplish that. No one is perfect. Yeah. And we all have flaws and we're all gonna make mistakes. And it's important to forgive yourself as a leader for making a mistake and learning from it and moving on. Um, but I always felt I had to be triple, quadruply prepared. And well dressed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Marta, you raised an important question, and when I was trying to keep my points into ten, I had forgiveness as one of them, and then it somehow slipped. But that is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. That issue of being able to forgive ourselves is critically important to our ability to be the strong and bold leader. Uh, so thank you for, for raising I've been told we have one more question or comment and then we're going to close. Joyce. Thank you. Well, let that be all of our legacy. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Betty. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is what I want to tell you all because when I'm here today, 20 years later, since 1970, when I found the program started, almost 50 years, the one thing, I, right, I have to tell you an anecdote because I was called for an interview to talk to a professor of government at Simmons College looking for someone who would help her with her grant for political education for women. Now that was not on most people's minds and I think it's remarkable that she did get this grant but she didn't know what to do with it. I don't think I did either at the moment but I thought well my god that's fabulous so I'm going to be interviewed. I go down to Street, the first thing that happened, and said, how do I get to Simmons College <laughs> information? He said, well, study hard and you'll get in. Then I can't I have to bring this up, Jackie. When we first met, we were holding signs outside of our little grammar school <laughs> in Newton. Yeah. On behalf of Mike Dukakis. Uh, <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, that's how we work. The third one thing I just want you all to know, don't give up. Right. Yes. I have so many times when I think back on it now that I could have said, oh, for God's sake, I can't do this. I mean, there's a little, not enough support. It's and true. I start saying to myself, well, then you have to build the support. And everybody isn't always going to love you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's another mm -hmm. thing. They don't. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, well, I, I just, I think this has been a really wonderful conversation. I want to, of course, thank Jackie for your wisdom and your example and your courage and your compassion. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank the panelists. Each of you had such pearls of wisdom, and I just love the way you related to your actual work with Jackie in all of your stories. Um, because that, I think a lot of us are, you know, brought together, we're either working on campaigns or we're working in workplaces. And we, these are fertile grounds for learning for all of us and for supporting each other and for advancing these aspirations and dreams of the next generation the way Jackie was explaining it. So thank you all for being part of this. Um, we have refreshments next door. I hope you'll join us for the reception, a chance to talk to Jackie, the panelists, the other fellows. Um, I, I have to just say we have food and we have soft drinks, and because this is UMass Boston in a time of crisis, it's a cash bar. But there, <laughs> there, there is alcohol. Um, anyway, so thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>